six. <laughs> My name is Terry and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Terry. Hey, Terry. <sighs> okay, it's funny that he brought up April Fools because I called my brother this morning and I said, I'm going to be speaking tonight. And I said, you need to pray for me. And he said, yeah, I'll pray for you. I said, they got me speaking on April Fools. Can you believe they picked me for April Fools? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you mean to tell me you're telling me it's about April Fools? He's like, usually you're pranking me on April Fools. I said, yeah, but I'm working on an honest program and I can't lie to you. <laughs> he said, man, you really have changed. You really do got God in your life. <laughs> Because I usually get them really good on, on uh, April's Fools, and I didn't prank anybody today, so uh, that's God working in my life, <laughs> keeping me honest. Uh, my sobriety date is September 16th, 2019. I have a sponsor who has a sponsor. I meet with my sponsor every week, and I'm here to tell you what it was like, um, what it was like, uh, what happened, and what I'm like now. I think I got that right. Um, so, um, if you can't tell from my accent, I was raised in Kentucky. <laughs> yeah, great stuff. Uh, anyways, it wasn't too great for me. Uh, I was, my maiden, um, my maiden name is Cows, so you can imagine being a plus-size chick in a Kentucky school with a cow field beside your school. Yeah, I got, yeah, it was not cool. Uh, you know, getting told to go milk your mama on your lunch break. Or, you know, these things happen. So you could tell that I was a loner from the get-go. Uh, alcoholic from birth, I tell you. Yeah, the, the struggle is real. Uh, but anyways, um, so I was born in Kentucky. And, and I divorced and kept my married name, let me just tell you that. And it wasn't because to keep the same name as the kids, it was to never go back to that name again. Uh, but anyways... <laughs> Uh, so thankful to be here tonight. I got the jitters a little bit, so y'all bear with me. Um, anyway, so what it was like, I was born in Kentucky. I'm the youngest of three. Uh, we're all two years apart. Um, always was very fearful as a child. Always thought somebody was going to get me. Uh, always thought somebody was going to break in the house. Always would see things at night. I prayed every night, Lord, please help me dream of a blank. Please help me dream of a blank. Please help me dream of a blank before I'd go to bed because I'd have just really bad nightmares as a child. And I and, uh, don't know why, but I did. And um, in the kind of environment I went, was brought up in, you know, i go to my mom and she'd be like, go back to bed, you know, just deal with it. So I um, always felt really out of place. Um, at the time, my mom had uh, remarried and I didn't have the same... We didn't have the same dads, um, and um, so I signed my name as, as my stepdad's name, and they signed their name as their real dad's name, but in the end, I found out later on that he wasn't my stepfather, that he wasn't my real father. Let's put it that way. He wasn't my real father. Um, so as a child, I was bullied a lot, um, made fun of a lot in school, was just more of a loner. Um, and uh, as I got older, you know, it was it was just kind of the, the 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 family atmosphere was just kind of weird because my stepfather always had me help him do things because I was really smart in school, so he always had me help him. Well, my family felt like he favoritized me, so they favoritized my brother and sister, and and then I was kind of the oddball because while they thought I was being favoritized, I was actually just. You know, he was just using me to do whatever he needed me to do to do his work or, or whatever. So I always felt like left out. I felt like I was left out from this side because, I, you know, if I didn't do something right, but I wasn't old enough to do those things, you know. Um, and then I felt separated from my other family, my grandparents and my aunts and stuff, because I felt like um, that they loved my sister and brother better than me. Um, so I always felt out of place with my family, and then I would go to school and was bullied a lot. So I felt out of place there. Um, so I did have some good moments in school. I did start band, and I was really good at, good at band, and that helped me to get my mind off of things. Schoolwork was always a big thing for me growing up as a child uh, because it got my mind off of things um, that I was dealing with at home. And um, so that was always, it wasn't that, that I got complimented on my grades, it was the fact that I did it for myself. So I take my job and my work and everything very seriously and always was really good at school, never struggled at school, always made A's and B's. Um, and then um, as I got older into high school, uh, it was like I was trying to live for God because I didn't want what I had 
and I would go to church. Um, I would walk to church uh, to go to church because we had some um, uh, uh, part of my mom's other husband, her third husband's um, family that that preached, and um, they took us in and. And, you know, I wasn't getting treated the greatest at home. And so he would buy us clothes, church clothes and school clothes. And uh, they would take us out to eat after church. And I always thought that that was really special, you know. Um, and I felt loved from that. And uh, so I clung to that. So I always tried to try to live for God to the best of my ability. But I really never did put his will first in, in that uh, so, you know, like I said, I was bullied all throughout, and I, my mom kicked us all out when we were 18, and, um, so I had to learn how to grow up really quick, quick. I didn't have a license, I didn't have a car, and, uh, she wouldn't give me any information to go to college, so I had to have people sign paperwork saying that she wouldn't give me any information or that I was self-supportive, and that's the way I went to school. And I went to school full time and I worked 70 hours a week to pay my bills because I knew if I didn't have the money to pay it, it wasn't going to get paid. Uh, so I, I was self-supportive and took care of myself, always in survival mode to, to make sure I had what I needed. And by the grace of God, I never not missed a bill, never missed a meal. <laughs> never did that either. Uh, so by the grace of God. Uh, as a young child, I really did. My first addiction was not actually alcohol. My first addiction was actually a food addiction. Go to figure my last name, Cal's Food Addiction, anyway. Uh, yeah, great stuff. Uh, but anyways, um, I struggled with that. You know, as you, uh, as you, uh, as I became a freshman, I was, you know, you start, girls start putting on weight, you know what I mean? And uh, I had a really hard time with that. And uh, I asked my mom, you know, to help me with that. And she decided the way to help me was to put locks on the refrigerator and locks on the cabinets. And so I started stealing money for food uh, to eat as much. She, she fed me. She gave me enough. But in my mind, I thought that I wasn't going to get enough, that I was going to be restricted. So I started stealing money and started eating as much as I could at school and just eating and eating and eating. And uh, my sister was able to have a key so she could eat what she wanted. But my sister had an eating disorder from the emotional abuse. She had an eating disorder the other way. She was anorexic and bulimic. So we all... We, you know, we hit our, mine wasn't hidden, but hers was hidden. We both clearly had issues. Uh, we both really had some issues, but, you know, mine was just visible. Um, so, anyways, we went through that and I uh, really had a really hard time through high school. My mom went through a divorce with the stepdad. And when I was younger, she finally told me that he wasn't my dad. And then I felt even worse because then I felt really out of place because she told me basically she had separated from her first husband and met my dad and they kind of had a fling and then she was pregnant and then he left her and she went back to the other and his name was on my birth certificate. It was all Kentucky stuff, okay? Kentucky stuff. <laughs> so anyways, it was all jacked up. So as a kid, I'm like so confused. Don't know what the heck's going on. Like this is just so weird to tell a little kid this stuff. So, I don't know, it was all jacked up. But anyway, so I really felt out of place. Really felt out of place, felt different. And I guess my brother and sister felt like I was being treated better, but I really wasn't. In the end, it really wasn't. But they had their own things that they were dealing with, and I had my own things that I was dealing with, and we dealed it, you know, we deal with life the best we could. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's what happened with me with the food addiction thing was my first addiction. Um, and then when I... I uh, graduated high school, I decided I did not ever want to be like my mom. I didn't want to be like my family. I wanted to get married. I wanted to have children. I wanted to feel loved. And I wanted uh, to n never have my kids experience anything that I've had to go through as a child. Um, and so basically after I, I graduated high school, I married the first Christian I met. He w I was 20 and he was 19. And we got married, and a month later we were pregnant because, you know, these things happen fast in Kentucky, too. Uh, <laughs> so I was pregnant, um, and he decided to go to be a pastor. He decided to go to seminary school, and we, we quit our jobs, and we moved to uh, seminary. Um, and it was, hard. it was hard being married because I always thought that he was immature and because I was kind of like the breadwinner, making sure everything was taken care of. And I always thought it was because he was young, and of course I had to grow up fast because I had to get everything on my own. Uh, but I didn't realize he had problems uh, until later on. So we, we pack up the family and we move. 
and we go um, to Eastern Kentucky, which I didn't think anything could be any more country than Eastern Kentucky, but you got people who fight at Walmart over the last bag of beef jerky. <laughs> and then I realized that I was as country as it was going to get. <laughs> Yeah, that was, a, that was quite a day. Um, anyways, um, so we get over there, and um, and he he was he was brilliant. He was brilliant. He got an A in Greek. Knew the Bible better than any man I've ever met in my life. Uh, just really smart guy. And um, he started having issues at school, and he uh, couldn't. It was like he was get out of his mind and delusional and just like they're you know I'm worried that they're going to come get us or something just really delusional I had no clue I mean I've dealt with some crazy it could, from a childhood but I had no deal I didn't know anything about mental illness I mean I think there's some undiagnosed obviously in my family but I <laughs> but I had never experienced it firsthand like this stuff I'm like wow um, so as it went along he kept on getting worse and worse and worse and so um, he went to a facility and at that time, they um, diagnosed him with um, post-traumatic, or the post-traumatic, like the PTSD, like what military have from childhood abuse. So they diagnosed him with that, and uh, he had to stay there for a little while to get, they put him on some meds for that. And then he came back to the, to the school, but he couldn't finish the school because his mom was just, it, it was just getting worse by the day. So we moved back home, and I had a job at that time when he had his, uh, having all these issues, uh, I had a, another daughter. Um, and so my girls were 22 months apart. Whew, it was tough. <laughs> but uh, I, I know I named him Hope and Faith for a reason, right? Um, <laughs> but um, anyways, we, um, we moved back to Kentucky, and um, he ended up having a really bad breakdown. I don't know how, it was by the grace of God I was even able to get him to the hospital. Um, I got the kids to a safe place because at this point I didn't know if he was going to hurt one of us or, or their children because when they get out of their mind they don't know what they're doing. But by the grace of God I was able to calm him down and he was like, they're going to get us, they're going to kill us, they're coming after us. And I got him talked down and took to the hospital. I was like, we're going to a safe place, we're going to a safe place. And, um, and then from there... Um, when he went to the hospital, he became, well, the hospital didn't help matters because they left him in there for hours um, and n knowing that he was out of his mind and um, he ended up hurting one of the nurses and so he was court ordered, He in the middle of the night he hurt a few people too, so he was court ordered to go to a facility for 30 to 45 days, I can't remember. So here I am, my husband quit his job. He is in a facility. I have no clue what's going on. It's a scary experience, scariest experience I've ever faced. And I'm raising these two kids, trying to figure out what's going on. And and um, when he finally had that breakdown and was uh, diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenic, and um, and it just it just it it, it was bad. Um, and he came home, um, but he wouldn't take his meds like he was supposed to. And, he, and you know, I had to pay to get him shaved. I had to make him take a shower. And when I'll come home, the whole house would be a mess because if he spilt cereal, he'd just leave it because he wasn't doing the meds and doing what he's supposed to. And I, you know, I even it was so bad I even had to clean his teeth. Um, but I did that for as long as I could. And you know, my family is, is is really religious, and so they believe in sickness and in health. You stay with what you're with. Um, but he was not the same. I mean, he couldn't even pass a Walmart test after this. We're talking about a man who's astronomically smart. It, 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 very smart, and and he couldn't even pass a Walmart test. Like he's told, like that's how much it hit flipped. And um, and so basically, you know, the whole time after his breakdown, I didn't see him as a husband anymore. He basically slept on the couch. I slept in the bed, and I'm trying to raise these two kids on my own. And it just got to a point where I was like, it's not fair to the children because they're losing both parents. Because I'm having to take care of him so much, I can't focus on them. And I'm trying to be the breadwinner, trying to do this, trying to do that. So I dealt with it for like four years, and then I finally, I finally made him go to a group home for a year. And um, then after that, I decided it was the best thing for me to, to get a divorce. It was the best thing for the girls. And so at that point, you know, here I am with all, all the guilt of that. My family didn't, you know, like the fact that I was a person. I uh, didn't like the, the fact that I did that. And so I felt even more alone, you know, making that decision because I felt 
bad about it because I knew he was sick. It wasn't his fault, but what do I do? You know, I'm a single mom trying to raise these kids. And so I did what I thought was right, and I know now that it was the right thing to do. But my friend at work, she saw how much, now we're going to get into the alcohol. I know y'all was waiting for that, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so my, um, my friend saw that I was really struggling. And um, she's like, girl, you're doing all this by yourself. You have so much stress on you. You need to drink you some wine at night. <laughs> well, I just got to thinking, I'm like, you know, I was raised Baptist, but I'm going to try me a little wine. See how this works. It's got a lot of stress. You know, i got to have some wine with some stress. Anyways, uh, so I started that. I've never been a sipper. I've never been a one-glasser. It's like Kool-Aid, and, yeah, it was, she, in fact, she, I, I, you know, believe from her symptoms that she's an alcoholic, and she looked at me, she's like, don't you know how to sip? I was like, no, <laughs> it's like Kool-Aid. What do you mean sip? Anyways, um, so that's kind of how it went. Um, but I turned out being like a, starting to do like a weekend drinker. Um, and then of course, you know, as you go along, oh, it's Wednesday, we're halfway there. Let me get another. Um, anyways, um, I think even before my alcoholism though, I still would have had issues because I never dealt with my past abuse. And so I still would have been a dry alcoholic <laughs> um, because I didn't deal with everything um, that I had been through when I was, you know, the absent, par absent minded parent, you know. Um, and as the kids got older, it got worse. And then um, I was in a 95 car pileup uh, on an Easter, actually. It was, it was uh, after I went to Kentucky to visit my family, and it was bad. It was, it, I mean, we were okay. Nobody was hurt by the grace of God. My children were okay. But the fear from the wreck really pushed me into my alcoholism for some odd reason. Um, um, and I started drinking more, and then I went, had to go to the doctor because I was having so, so much panic attacks and anxiety attacks. I thought I was losing my mind, and they checked me for everything, man. They checked me for a brain tumor. <laughs> I, I, was, I was so stressed with the things that was going on that I was calling, you know, like how your work gives you that 1-800 number to call the nurse hotline. I would be calling the nurse hotline. I was looking on Google, and I, not once did I ever think it was my alcohol. I'm like, I got to find the answer to this. This is some crazy stuff, you know. And um, I thought <laughs> it was crazy, man. I'm telling you, I thought I was losing my mind. Uh, but anyways, um, and I was having head pressure, and just really thought I had a brain tumor. I mean, I thought I was, I thought I was doomed. But anyway, so they started me on. Um, anxiety meds, but with the anxiety meds, I kind of had to calm down on the alcohol because I'm like, well, I can't drink with the anxiety meds. It says not to drink. Of course, you know, I'm trying to be honest and not drink with it. So then I was like, oh, it's Friday. I won't take a pill tonight. <laughs> Get my wine in. And then it went from that to, oh, well, let's go a few days without it and, and, and take my drink. And um, anyway, so it just kept on progressing, progressing, progressing. And then... Um, I went a whole year without drinking. I don't know how I did it, but I did it. I went a whole year without drinking and thought that I got this nip nipped. Um, and then, of course, my sister-in-law drinks, and so she was drinking. I was like, well, she can drink. I can drink. You know, we're not, I'm not an alcoholic. I don't have issues. So I started drinking, and it went down the hill from there, and it got really bad. Um, and then I switched from having a job where I was working from home some, and that made it easier to drink. Uh, I would drink during the day while I was working. That doesn't always work out for you very well. Uh, and, and in between all that time when I was going to the doctor for anxiety, I still, didn't, I still did not think it was alcohol. And, and one, one night I woke up in the middle of the night, night and the girl said, you do know you got up and peed in our dresser drawer, right? <laughs> and I'm like, there is no way like, that I peed in your dresser drawer. And I'm like, no, what are you talking about? And I go, and like the whole, I mean, I peed a lot. Like that whole thing, the whole drawer. I'm like, oh my gosh, did I do that? And I still didn't think it was my alcoholism. I thought I was sleepwalking. So, I was like, I must have had a bad dream, you know? 
anyway, so that was kind of really embarrassing. My kids still make fun of me for it, but it's, it's definitely <laughs> it's definitely shameful when you're sober and like, why did I do that? But anyways, um, so that was one experience. <laughs> And then as I go along, like I said, it gets worse and worse and worse. And then um, I had a conference call. Ha! Ah, I do not recommend drinking wine while you're doing a conference call and you're the one leading it. It doesn't end well. Well, it did in my case, but normally it might not end well. And so uh, I led the whole call, and I had a blackout. I don't remember anything I said on that call. Now, that's embarrassing. And I thought, I, I was like, oh, crap, I'm going to lose my job. Like, what am I going to do? Like... So I'm like, I'm going to have to lie about this. So I called one sales rep, and I said, you know what? I have anxiety really bad. I took a Xanax. I don't remember anything I said on that call. Can you please tell? Oh, it was the best call ever, girl. You had it set straight. You ha I, I don't remember any of it. And I had to call one of the customer service reps to make sure with him, too, because you know how to have two witnesses. I couldn't just have one witness. I have two witnesses. <laughs> and I'm like, this is affecting my job, you know. And, um, and then I went from that to... Uh, I, I got into a bad relationship. Of course, you know, when you're an alcoholic, you don't realize that you're in a bad relationship until it's too late. Um, and that's kind of what it was. And um, anyway, so I was in a, in a bad relationship. At this point, I could not control my drinking, no matter what I did. Like, I don't even know how many bottles of wine I was drinking, honestly. Um, and it was just affecting me to a very high level. And I didn't want to drink anymore, but I didn't know how to stop, and I didn't want to, I was in denial, didn't think I had a problem, blamed it on the relationship, <clears throat> just could not stop. And it was just bad. It was to the point where I was canceling, like I would, my daughter was uh, in band, and I would be like, I don't feel like going tonight. Um, can we stay home? Of course, in Wilmington, they make it easy because they have the drive through wine thing so you can get your kids some snacks and get your wine and go home. And I bribed them with snacks like, oh, let's miss your band. Let's go through the drive through thing. That's cool, right? Yeah. Let's get you some Skittles. Anyways, um, <laughs> so we would do that. And it was I wasn't there for them. You know, I wasn't there to their events because I was always either, either it wasn't necessarily that I wanted to drink. It was I was so sick that I couldn't go without drinking, you know what I mean? It was just like my stomach, like I would try to go, but I couldn't, I would just be so sick to my stomach and, and you know how it is. Um, but anyway, so um, I, at this point I was like, the only way I, I can see out of this is to have a baby, because you know, that's how we think alcoholic. Like if I get pregnant, I know I'm not gonna, I know I'm not gonna mess this up, I'm gonna be okay. Uh, so I prayed. I was like, Lord, help me get pregnant. Um, of course, a bad relationship, getting pregnant is not a cool thing, but that's what happened. So, uh, And I'm so thankful for my son. He's such a miracle baby. He's just my everything. Um, but anyways, I got pregnant, and I didn't get drunk while I was pregnant, but there was a couple times I did have the little wine things because I had quit cold turkey. I was going crazy. Um, but I did manage to go um, go through the pregnancy and everything was okay. And I thought I had it nipped again. I thought I just took it back to blaming it the relationship. He's the one. He did this to me. Like that was why I was drinking. No wonder anybody would drink things with that man. Um, but then um, my son was born January 2018 and my birthday was in April. And um, yeah, it's my birthday month too. You picked me on the right time. Anyways, um, and uh, I was like, well, I can have wine. I don't have a problem. I went to pregnancy, my son, you know, everything's okay. I can do this. And, of course, it went right back. And um, it, was just, it was just that vicious cycle, you know. When we start back, we can't stop. We try to limit it on weekends. We try to limit it, you know, Wednesdays and weekends before you know it, you're drinking every day. And that's kind of what happened. And I was scared. I was scared because I did not, I knew that that time when I was in that relationship that it had gotten so bad that I did not want to be that, that anymore, but I knew it was getting close. And I was a mess. I didn't want to live anymore uh, because I felt like I wasn't a good enough mom. Like uh, somebody else can raise them better because I'm not really able to be present to be the mom that I needed to be. And I had so much stuff. You know, so much baggage that we have and then so many mistakes that we make while we're drinking and uh, all the bad choices, all the bad, you know, being not not the parent we need to be, not the person we need to be. And uh, it was hard and uh, and I just, I just didn't want to do it anymore. And um, 
Then I felt bad because I was like, well, I'm going to take my life. I have three kids. I should be happy. I love my kids. You know, but I was just at that, that place where it's like, it, you know, it's dark and it's lonely. It's a lonely place. And uh, my uh, friend who's an alcoholic, you know, we attract each other. It's a wonderful thing. Um, we made a pact um, that we would try to stop drinking um, and we would journal. We were going to journal every day and we were going to exchange our journals and it was going to be an awesome thing. I was like, I, I can do this. She's doing it with me. I'm going to do it. We're going to do it. And um, anyway, so we, we started doing that and uh, of course I couldn't do it. I'm like, I can't do it. Like, and I don't want to tell her, but I can't do it. I can't, I can't go without the alcohol. And um, and she knew, she knew I was an alcoholic because she came and uh, I was drinking during the day. And us alcoholics know each other. If we're drinking during the day, you're by George, you're probably alcoholic, especially if you're long drinking. And she she recognized it. She didn't tell me I was an alcoholic, but she knew I was an alcoholic. And um, so I finally admitted to her, I'm like, I can't I can't do this. I was like, I'm trying to do this because I want to do this because I know it's the right thing to do, and I want to do this because you're doing it, but I can't do it. And she was so kind to me because she let me know she was doing AA. And that's why she was doing it, and I couldn't do it. And um, she told me about the AA. She even helped me look up the meetings here. And I was terrified because even though she told me a little bit about AA, I thought, they're going to take my kids away. And I'm, I'm a, I mean, I take good care of my kids. I don't abuse my kids, but they're going to take my kids away. They say it's anonymous, but I don't believe it's anonymous. Like, is it really anonymous? <laughs> Like, they gonna know my business, and I'm gonna have to tell them, like, this is not cool. And so I was, like, shaking. I mean, I was scared to death to come here. Also, one experience that I just want to share, because I know sometimes as parents we feel really guilty about past things, and one of the things that really breaks my heart now um, that happened in my alcoholism, how I, I, so I, I went a month without drinking, and I thought, you know, I could do this, you know, and went to see my uncle, and of course, he, he drinks too, and I thought, I can do this, and uh, well, when I was there, I started drinking again. Well, I was on a, a, a how crazy our minds are. I was on a low-carb diet trying to lose weight, trying to get it together, and that's why I had quit, drink, quit drinking too, was mainly for that. Um, and he told me, he's like, well, you know, rum doesn't have no carbs. Well, I've always done wine. I've never did hard liquor. So I, you know, anyway, so I was like, oh, I can drink and, and still do my low carb. This is awesome, you know. And so anyways, I bought some of those little shots of rum. It, you know, with wine, you kind of buzz and go, this, you don't know what the heck's going to hit you, when it's going to hit you, or what's going to happen. And so anyways, um. I had had too much. My daughter was hiding the last two shots. She was like, Mom, I think you need to go to bed. I was like, I think I need another bottle. Anyways, um, she had shared with me something that my other daughter had done that was bad, and I was not ready to take it, not ready to deal with it, fearful for my other child that she made this choice, and I was just nasty to her. I, I berated her and made her feel horrible. And this is what alcoholism does. It's, it's, it's not a game. It's not funny. It's just it's what it does. I mean, it, it causes us to be people who we're not. And at that time, it was, you know, I, I've told her sorry over and over again about it. It's still, you know, the only thing that keeps me going now with that experience is that I can share it with another struggling mother who knows that I can use my experience, strength, and hope that they don't have to feel like they're alone for the choices they make because we only have today we can only make good today, and that's what this program teaches us, uh, that we, we do it today. Um, and, and that makes it how we can live and, and not live in that shame and guilt or remorse. So that was one of the experiences that I had. So back to getting to the meeting. So I'm driving. I'm, like, ready to turn around. I'm shaking, like, literally. I'm terrified of this going to this meeting. I mean, that's how... I just really thought that something was going to happen with my kids, and I'm the only care caretaker for my children, and, and it just really stressed me out. Um, and I get to the parking lot, and um, it was at the Aberdeen building. It was one of the first meeting, and uh, and I was uh, ready to turn around. In fact, I, I, I put it in park. I was ready to reverse, and one of the ladies spotted me, and I was like, crap, she spotted me. <laughs> She's walking to my car as we speak. And I can't get out of this. And so I got in there, and um, then they shared about me with, with primary purpose. And I'm so glad that God led me to primary purpose. 
I mean, they were nice and everything like that, but I didn't have that right off connection like I did in this group. And and so I came here and I'm thankful for Roxana and Ina. Um, they're the two I connected with first. And, and, you know, when you go through a life of not feeling that love and acceptance like you should, you, this, you need people in the program to show you that you're loved because you feel separate, you feel isolated. It's, it, it, you know, that's how I was in my alcoholism, and that's why it's so important for us to show that love to other people that are struggling because if they got to feel that. And um, I'm so glad that they did that for me. They showed me love and they showed me kindness, and I didn't run because of that. Because I surely, w I don't think I would have made it if I didn't have people that showed me love, and um, and they showed me strong, uh, strong uh, fellowship, and uh, forever grateful for that. Um, and I thank my friend, my friend Helen, for telling me about the program. And then from there, you know, it's, it's cleanup time, right? That's where we get to cleanup time. I'll tell you what, I was so desperate when I came to this program. I don't care if I talked to the President of the United States, I would tell him everything I've ever done because that's how desperate I wanted to feel better. And, um, I mean, it's scary. It, it, it's scary. And, uh, it, it, you know, you, you, when you go through your steps, you do, it does trudge up some things. But I'll tell you what, when I got to that fifth step, and she still loved me afterwards, thank God. Uh, and told me some, shared me some experience that she had that I didn't have to feel alone, and she still loved me and still cared about me, and I cared about my well-being. And I tell you right now, I have been to church off and on. I've been baptized. I don't even know how many times trying to get this stuff figured out. I have never experienced a freedom than that day when I let that go. And uh, when I did my fifth step, it was the most amazing day of my life because for once, and all my 30-something years, don't wait that long. Young people, don't wait that long. Please don't. But um, I have experienced a freedom. And for once, I felt loved and cared about. I felt uh, the presence of my higher power in my life. And I, I turned my will over and um, made amends where I needed to make amends. Uh, even if it cost me my job, my, I, yes, I did call that sales rep. Well, the Lord worked it out because uh, the sales rep called me and said, I'm going to be coming to your account tomorrow. I have your account now. And I was like, crap, why did she go from the old account and now she's here? Like, how did she get to be my rep again? And, of course, you know, I called everybody in the program trying to get weasel my way out of telling I did not want to tell her I was an alcoholic. But how can you tell somebody that you're drinking during the day instead of doing a Xanax to tell them the truth <laughs> that you really were drunk without telling them you're alcoholic? So anyways, I called everybody that you could think of in this program. Yes, I called Steve. Yes, I did. <laughs> ah, but my higher power had me, and I'll tell you what, it was, it was churning. It was like I have to do this right. I have to tell her the truth. If it costs me my job, God's going to give me another one, but it just was on me. And when it's on you, please, 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 whatever you do, please just get it out and do it like you're supposed to. Because I knew if I wouldn't be honest with her, the very honest, and tell her all of that, then I would never have that chance again. Because if I tried to tell her again, she'd never trust me again. Because I would have only told her the half truth. So she came, and I told her, I said, I have something to share with you. I said, I'm really kind of embarrassed about it. I said, but I'm an alcoholic. And I said, and that day when I couldn't remember what I was happening on the conversation because I was drunk. And I, I said, I apologize for lying to you. And she said, well, Terry, she said, I know what your life was going through. <clears throat> she said, I know what your life was going through. I know you did a great job at what you did. You were a very good worker. Um, thank God I was that day on that conference call that I was drunk. Whew. Anyways. Um, but she was like, I just want to know that you're okay. Are you okay? Yes, ma'am, I'm, in, I'm uh, an Alcoholics Anonymous, and my kids are okay, and, and we're okay. And I'm working my program. I'm putting God first, and I'm doing service in the community. And God is, God is working on me, and, and I'm in a stable place and stay, doing good. She said, then that's all I care about. And I don't even know if she understood half the stuff I said because I was, y'all know me. I'm surprised I, I did a little bit, but usually it's like the garbage pail kid cars. There's snot and everything everywhere when I get emotional. Uh, yeah, it, get, it gets pretty bad. And probably the young folks don't even know what those are, but it gets, it gets pretty bad. 
uh, but anyways, um, so um, now um, we're going into talking about what my relationship is now. Uh, first of all, I pray every morning, pray every night. I journal every day. I do my tenth step at night every day, and I um, that's what keeps me sober. That's the only thing that's going to keep us sober and, and to help other people. And, and I try with the best of my ability to help other people. Um, when I first got into program, the thing that saved me the most really was uh, I was I was really on edge when I first came in. Just that shaky, that feeling sick, and you want sugar, and you all out of place. And um, and then um, Anna would be like, hey, you want to go to detox? I was like, yeah, I need to go to detox and, and talk to some people. I didn't know what I was doing. I still don't know what I'm doing. But I just went, and I'm like, and I was scared to even go there because, you know, when you're first sober, you're, like, shaky. You don't want to be around people. Like, I, you know, my whole life has been just me and my kids. Like, I was very isolated. I didn't have a lot of friends. In fact, uh, I hope Lucy's on, on today. Lucy's a very special person to me. Um, She's, she's a sober friend. We don't have many of those, do we? Ha! Anyways, um, she was, when I first moved here to North Carolina years ago, she, she was the first person that really loved me unconditionally, and she was there for me on my wreck at that 95 car pileup. She came and got me and my family um, in the middle of the night. So she's, she's been there for me. She's here supporting me tonight, and I'm thankful she's on, on Zoom listening to me from the, the good old sunny part of Florida. You know, don't be mad at her. Don't have resentments. Um, anyways, um, but she's, she's sweet, and she was the first time that I felt like somebody could love me and care about me, and aside from the program, the people in the program. And that's where my family is now. I consider you all my family. Um, and you guys have supported me through all of this. Um, you know, it, it's not easy when you become sober. Uh, for me, life was harder because... I have all these things coming at, at me, and I don't have my coping mechanisms. Uh, you know, if somebody says it's easy in sobriety, it's not, but it's worth it. Uh, first coming in sobriety, my, um, my uh, girl's dad, the one that's schizophrenic, um, he ended up being in jail um, for a period of time because he, he was out of his mind, and he tried to go to the crisis center, and they wouldn't take him. And um, and he and he tried to he thought he was trying to save somebody he thought somebody was being held captive and he tried to go in somebody's house and uh, I had to he lost over a hundred pounds in less than three months he was going to die in there because he thought they were trying to poison him he wasn't on meds he was out of his mind if I had not been sober I would not have been able to help him I was able to talk to the judges and let them know like he's been schizophrenic since he's been in his early twenties I was like. He needs help. Like, if something happens to him, I can guarantee you we're going to be on every news station in this country. And so you better make sure he gets taken care of. And if, had I not been sober, I wouldn't have been able to help him. And uh, he was able, I was able to get him into a group home, and they let him out with no, he didn't have any charges. They dropped his charges and didn't have to pay bail or anything after I got done convincing them, like, he's really mentally ill. He's been mentally ill for all these years. You can get his medical records, and he tried to get help, and nobody would help him. So if I had not been sober... I wouldn't have been able to do that. That was only in the first few months of sobriety this happened. Um, and then my son ha ended up having a seizure. I thought he died in my arms. It was the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. He got His fever had spiked, and he, and he had a seizure. And I had to go in the ambulance with him. If I would have been drinking, I wouldn't have been able to be there for my son. Um, and my daughter, um, within the first six months, my daughter ran away from home. Um, and I had to, uh, I'm thankful for women in the program um, um, that mediated it and, and helped her get back home. And we were able to have that relationship at that time, you know, to get that right. Um, but these are all things, these are all realities that happen in sobriety. But if it weren't for my higher power in this program, I wouldn't have been able to make it through that. And then, look, I'm checking my time because I'm trying to draw it out, you know, I'm saying you what? I know that I know that he, uh, he's talked about going one minute early, Blake. Like when you're the speaker, you want to go like five minutes late, you know. Uh, but anyways, um, had I not been sober and had I not had my higher power, I wouldn't have been able to go through those things. And I still have things I'm struggling with. My daughter, my older daughter's in active addiction right now, and it's hard. It's hard because it, it makes you feel like sometimes that you could have done things differently, but I know that people make their choices. It don't matter. You hear people in here. You can have a perfect life, perfect family life, and you still get an addiction. So I can't put that on myself. Um, the way that I can help my daughter is to go help somebody else. 
she's not willing to hear it right now, and she's not willing to accept it right now, but there's a lot of people who are, are dying from this disease who wants to hear it and wants you to be there for them. So I pray that God will continue to use me in that manner to help somebody else who's still suffering with this disease because it could have taken me easily. Um, my son, uh, how it's affected my son being sober. Well, guess what? My son prays every night on his knees. He holds his hands like this. Dear Lord, thank you for my dinosaurs. Amen. <laughs> and I ask him every night, you want to say thank you for your mama, your sister, your food? Thank you for my dinosaurs. <laughs> and that's all God. And uh, my uh, middle child is growing leaps and bounds. She went from a 1.2 grade point average to now she, her, report, her last report card shouldn't have below 86. And this is because I'm involved with her life. I'm making sure to take care of her and be there for her like I wasn't before. Um, and really my main amends is to my children because that's, that's who I hurt the most. So for me it's important to show them every day that I love them, that I'm there for them if they need me. Uh, it's, it's hard with my one that's in, in the addiction because I kind of have to set those healthy boundaries. Um, <laughs> Codependency is an issue for us alcoholics and I have to work on that. So I have to set these healthy boundaries so I don't have her put me through an emotional roller coaster. Yes, I love her. Yes, I care about her. Yes, I want her to have the same freedom I have. But I know she's going to get there. I know it'll just take some time. So guess what? I pray to my higher power. Please help her to have enough pain. That's a hard prayer. Please let her have enough pain where she can have this freedom and get it at an early age and not be like me and be at 38 getting it because it's, it's a lot of years wasted. But I still can use experience, strength, and hope to help somebody else. Um, and so my, my children are doing great. I'm really proud of them all. Um, and if it was not for this program, I, I would not be there. My job, like when I first got sober, I was always in the door, out the door. I didn't even have my desk decorated at work. I was like applying for jobs. Uh, try to get the heck up out of there because if somebody said something that day that offended me, whether it was them having a bad day or whether it was me, I, I got to get out of here. Peace out. I got to find me something else. Like, uh, you know, I got to do this. Uh, but now it's like, okay, you know, they have they have their spiritual sickness. I have to work on me. And, and, and even in my relationship with people, there are people at my work that, like, I'm like, oh, my goodness, they're character defects. What's wrong with them? Like, they have issues. And then my higher power revealed to me, Terry, it's either you have some of the same issues or you used to be like that and you need to be loving and caring to these people. And um, anyway, so I became close friends with people that I thought were not good people. And that's God changing me, like, there was one lady that I just, I was like, what is wrong with her? You know, what is her issue? And when the, my higher power revealed to me, like, Terry, what, what's your issue? What do you have going on? What have, you, what have I brought you from? And we're best friends now. Like, we walk on breaks. We, like, walk at lunch. Yeah. Like, she's checking on me. I'm checking her. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that's what, that's what AA does for you. Uh, my job is going good. I'm not ready to run. I actually did decorate my desk. <laughs> and um, and I'm there. It's not always easy. There's always going to be things that come up, things that we have to deal with on a daily basis. I thank I thank the Lord for uh, the God God high power for um, my sponsor. Um, she's really been helpful because I think that's why it's so important to have a sponsor because we go on emotional crazy. Well, I do. Maybe y'all don't. I don't know. I'll raise my hand twice on that. <laughs> crazy mo uh, emotional roller coasters where it's just like we have to, I have to. I keep on saying we. Y'all fend for yourself. But I have to have my sponsor involved um, because sometimes I can't see the tree from the forest in my mind is all gets messed up. Uh, and sometimes it's hard because I don't want to tell whatever I'm thinking or wherever I'm at or I just want to be angry sometimes. I want to be, I don't want, I don't want the right answer because right now I just don't want to do what's right. <laughs> but when I talk to her and I get it all out and she lets me know that it's okay and, um, and then I know it's all right. But uh, I, I would like to um, do a special thanks for all my people um, that are online. If they got to come on, some of them were having some issues with the passcode. <laughs> Hopefully I didn't give them the wrong one, but I thank them for joining. Um, I thank you guys for being my family. 
you know, that's important to have that. And I, I didn't really have that as much like you should growing up. So for you guys to take me in as family, you know, Elizabeth, Roxana, Anna, Courtney, Megan, all you guys, all you ladies, Haley, uh, I love you all. Y'all know that, right? I'm thankful for the strong ladies in the program that helped me stay sober in my higher power. I would not be here today if it was not for this program. My kids would not have their mother if it was not for this program. So thank you for letting me share.